Welcome back. We are grateful to have Brother Billy Tan who will be talking to us today about the pitfall of meditation, self-hypnosis. So during this talk, we will be learning about the difference between self-hypnosis and meditation. We will also be, uh, we will also find out how we may avoid the pitfall of falling into self-hypnosis when we meditate. So as a clinical hypnotherapist trainee myself and a meditation practitioner, I find this topic extremely interesting because many people have asked me, what is the difference between meditation and hypnosis? So I look very forward to explore this today with Brother Bidi. But before that, allow me to introduce Brother Bidi. Brother Billy is a retired business development consultant armed with very interesting qualifications around his belt. Not only is he certified as a master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming, he is also a certified clinical hypnotherapist, a laughter yoga teacher and laughter ambassador. So in the sharing of the Dharma, in sharing the Dharma, Brother Billy has studied under the late venerable Dr. M. Punaji Mahathera. Brother Billy is a very experienced speaker who has delivered Dharma sharing throughout Peninsula Malaysia. In recent years, Brother Billy has shared the Dharma extensively in the Philippines as resident, as a resident Dharma lecturer at Wisdom Park, Manila. He has also given Dharma talks to Catholic seminary students, universities, theosophical societies, and uh, as well as to inmates at the women's prison in Metro Manila. So we will now be starting the talk. While you are tuning in and watching the talk, as and when any questions or burning thoughts or comments arise in your mind, feel free to post them on the Facebook and YouTube chats. And Brother Billy will address them as many questions as, as possible today. So maybe now be enlightened on the pitfall of meditation, self-hypnosis. Thank you very much for that fine introduction. Good morning, Sukihotu. A warm welcome to all of you. I'm very thankful that Shah Alam Buddhi Society has invited me to offer this sharing. So today's sharing will be meditation pitfall, self-hypnosis. Before I get into this topic, I would like to share with you uh, some very important information. First is to let you know that there is very little difference between this meditative state of mind and this hypnotic state of mind. So we have to be very careful when we begin our meditation. If we are not attentive to our mental conditioning when we begin to meditate, then we could fall into what we call the hypnagogic effect. When we begin to experience this hypnagogic effect, it leads us into a hypnotic state where the mind begins to imagine things. And these imaginations can seem to be very real. So that is really a major pitfall in meditation practice if we are not careful. So today we're going to look at what's the difference between meditative state and hypnotic state and how we can avoid this pitfall of falling into self-hypnosis. Before I elaborate any further, I would like to share with you a very useful link. Right? So this is the link. You can download the slides that I will be using so you can follow along with this presentation tiny.cc slash sabs dash hypnosis. Okay, so if you can download this, you can then use the PowerPoint presentation slides to follow along with my presentation. Right. Without further ado, let's begin with today's sharing. When we speak of meditation, it comes from that word from the Buddha Dharma called Bhavana. Bhavana is often translated as cultivation and uh, development of mind, but uh, very popularly, it's just called meditation in short. 
Now, later on in today's sharing, I'm going to bring to your attention that the word meditation is not a very accurate or, or very helpful word in the sense that meditation can also mean a lot of other things to other people, unless we qualify it by saying Buddhist meditation. But otherwise, if we just say meditation, it can mean different things. Right? I'll talk about that in a moment. But what is bhavana then? Well, my teacher, Venerable Punaji, has basically defined this. He said, it is by being conscious all the time that we can control our emotions. The constant practice of being conscious is what the Buddha called development or bhavana. So in other words, the word bhavana means development. Development of what? Development of the mind. Right. Basically, when we say the mind, we're not just talking about what goes on in the brain. The mind basically also affects the whole body. The mind and the body are not separated in the sense that what happens in the body affects the mind. What happens in the mind affects the body. Right? So when we speak of bhavana, then we're talking about development. At this point, I just want to very quickly uh, mention that uh, sometimes people say cultivation. And many people interchange the word cultivation with development. Now, at this point, I just want to clarify. There is a very slight difference right, uh, between the meaning of cultivation and development. Cultivation is basically a set of practices we, we do. So we we carry out a certain set of practices and this carrying out of the practice is called cultivation. We cultivate. Development is taking it one, one step further. Development is basically as we practice this cultivation, we begin to realize the fruits of our cultivation. So in, in saying development, we are also referring to some fruits or fruition of the practice. So here, bhavana is not just talking about going through the motion of what we call meditation, but also experiencing the fruits of the meditation. So I hope that is clear, that there is a very subtle difference between cultivation and development, whereby development refers to uh, some level of fruition of the practice. Okay, so with this, with this uh, explanation of the term bhavana by Bhante Punaji, you can see it's very clearly that Bhante was referring to developing the mind to be conscious. It is by being conscious all the time that we can control our emotions. So here, Bhante was also referring to the fact that bhavana is helping us to control our emotions. So let's just listen to what Bhante has to say about this process of conscious thinking and emotional thinking. Right? When we speak about the mind, we really have two minds. Most people don't know that. One mind is the thinking mind. The other mind is the emotional mind. Now the thinking mind can think, but it is the emotional mind that wants things or hates things or fears things or worries about things, that is the emotional mind. Now when you come to the temple and uh, say, take up the five precepts, it is the thinking mind that, that is doing that. But you go home and maybe you quarrel with your 
husband or wife or whoever or maybe neighbors or why why is that that is done by the emotional mind not the thinking mind and so even if we understand when you read the book you understand everything your understanding is done by the thinking mind but you cannot live according to your understanding because the emotional mind goes in the opposite direction are we free from crime are we free from wars are we free from terrorism injustice why all these things because the emotional mind is dominating the world today the thinking mind is only a slave of the emotional mind this is why the thinking mind has created the nuclear weapon that can even destroy the world because everything that the thinking mind has done is what the emotional mind wants so this is why the buddha pointed out that what we need is to start working according to the thinking mind and not the emotional mind that the thinking mind should dominate the world not the emotional mind the the thinking mind has to learn to control the emotional mind that is the important thing and that is what we learn in the teachings of the buddha what we call meditation is learning to gain control over the emotional mind So Bhante was explaining that we have a thinking mind and an emotional mind. Let's go through what uh, briefly he has uh, mentioned. He says that it is the emotional mind that wants things, fears things, and worries about things, and it is dominating the world in the sense that it is really controlling us. We are spellbound by our emotional mind, without proper development without proper cultivation of the mind we are easily controlled by emotions and the thinking mind as a result of that the thinking mind is behaving like a slave to the emotional mind and therefore that's why the buddha taught us that meditation bhavana trains the thinking mind to gain control over the emotional mind So now I hope you are clear that the first benefit we get from the practice of bhavana is that we can sharpen our thinking mind and by doing so we can gain control over the emotional mind and not allow the emotional mind control us. So let's look at what is the meaning of this thing called mind, right? Mind is really doesn't exist mind does not exist at all the buddha used three words to describe mind and the first word the buddha used is vijnana normally translated as consciousness but bhante punna ji translated more precisely and calls it perception basically this vijnana is referring to the process of perception this arises from the pancha kanda right the five aggregates this process of perception the five aggregates leads us to become aware of objects in the environment so we begin to experience the awareness of what was perceived through the sense organ 
And this awareness is vijnana. And the second word the Buddha used to describe the mind is mano. This refers to the thinking mind, or what the, we normally call cognitive process, the cognition and the conception. Cognition is basically the process of thinking, and conception is the process of creating ideas. Right? So what is happening in this, this aspect of the mind, that the mano is interpreting what was perceived through the sense organs. So it identifies what has been perceived, and this process of identification is called papancha. So it identifies uh, what has been perceived and gives meaning to it. And at the same time, it is able to cognize the experience. That means it is able to define the experience, be aware of what the experience is, and begin to create concepts about the experience. So it's concepts, and with concepts, it gives us a choice of how we can respond to what has been perceived and cognized. And that is mano, the cognitive process. This is basically the thinking mind. Then the third word the Buddha used is chitta, and this is referring to the affective process. The layman's term for this is emotions. So this is really our emotional mind, the chitta. Right? So where it leads to mood and temperament. So when we experience something in the environment, we begin to feel whether it is pleasant or unpleasant. And as a result of this pleasantness or unpleasantness of what has been experienced, we experience mood. Mood means whether we like something, we don't like something, we feel good about it or we don't feel good about it. So that's the mood. Temperament is referring to our urge to react. We have an emotional urge to want to react. That is our temperament. That's why when we react badly, we call it temper, having a temper. So it's mood is how we feel about something. Temperament is the urge to react to how we feel. So this is really the emotional mind. And that's what emotion is all about. It is always reacting to whether we feel good or don't feel good about something. And not only that, it also personalizes the experience, clinging on to the experience, attaching to the experience, and calling this my experience. So we begin to, to cling on, right? grasp the experience. And this is also something that the Buddha has warned us against. When we begin to cling on to the experience, grasping the experience, grasping at the signs and the features of everything we experience, it leads to suffering. So this is really the chitta, and chitta is really what causes us a lot of suffering. So the whole idea of bhavana is to tame the chitta, to bring the chitta to a state of stillness, and to sharpen the mano, and at the same time, to bring the chitta and the mano together, because the chitta and the mano is always in conflict. The chitta just wants things. The mano is rational. It can differentiate what is good and bad. But the chitta is always going after what uh, lust and greed or trying to fight against anger and hatred, things that lead to anger and hatred. And also this clinging leads to the delusion of a self-centered existence. That is what the chitta is doing. So you will, you will see later in the sutras, the Buddha has mentioned that we are trying to tame the chitta, bring the chitta to a state of stillness, calm the chitta, compose the chitta, <clears throat> and then unifying chitta with mano so that the two minds are not fighting, the two minds become one. That's why it's called a unified mind. So one of the first major fruition of the meditation, uh, bhavana, is to unify the two minds. And this unification process happens when we begin to experience the jhanas. The jhana is basically leading to the full unification of mano and chitta. Now I'm going to share with you a very interesting explanation by Bhante Punaji of this term anusayam. Basically anusayam is referring to this repressed unconscious memory that we have these underlying tendencies, right? this, this uh, repressed memory that keeps popping up 
disturbing us. And this is the work of the chitta. And this is really what happens when we try to meditate, sitting there quietly. And if we are not remaining fully conscious, this process of anusayam begins to arise and repress unconscious memory will pop up and disturb the meditation. Anusaya really means, saya, saya means sleeping. Anusaya means sleeping. That means, what is the meaning of sleeping? This is what Sigmund Freud called repression. That means people begin to forget things. And uh, once it is forgotten, you don't even know that you are having certain things. You are not aware of it. And that is that kind of sleeping is uh, uh, what is called repression. And so, uh, what is called psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud was to bring out these hidden, repressed things, bring it out and to become aware of it. What is unconscious is made conscious. So to make the unconscious conscious is uh, what the Buddha, uh, not what the uh, Sigmund Freud did, and that is what the Buddha did also, ultimately, to make the unconscious conscious. That unconsciousness is uh, what is called avijja. And so our mind is normally in an unconscious state. Most of the time we are, although we think we are conscious, most of the time we are acting unconsciously. This is the point. And uh, this is why Sigmund Freud used the analogy of the iceberg. When the iceberg is kept in the water, it's like a piece of ice you put in the water, it begins to float. What is the out of the water is only a small piece, the rest is inside the water. So in the same way our mind, when we say we are conscious, we are only a small piece is conscious, the rest is all happening unconsciously. So you have heard Bhante explain the definition of Anusayam. And it is this process of anusayam that leads to, to disturbance of the mind. And there are five kinds of disturbance to the mind. We call them the five hindrances. So these five hindrances arise to disturb our meditation process. So if we do not remain conscious during the physical and mental cultivations, we invariably experience five types of emotional disturbances called the five hindrances. And these five hindrances corrupt the thinking mind and weaken our wisdom. So these five hindrances arise to disturb our meditation. That's why it's very important that when we practice meditation, the first thing we need to do is to bring these five hindrances to a state of stillness so that they do not arise to disturb us. And if we're able to suspend and stop these five hindrances momentarily, at least for a while, then we begin to enter into a deeper state of meditation called the jhanas. Without stopping the five hindrances, 
then we will not be able to enter the jhanas because these five hindrances keep disturbing the mind, corrupt the mind, weaken our wisdom. So we will not be able to experience jhana. Now, without being enlightened, as all of us who are not enlightened beings, we cannot get rid of the five hindrances. We can train our mind to reduce the harmful effects of the five hindrances. But until we become enlightened, we cannot completely get rid of the five hindrances. So the five hindrances remain until one becomes enlightened. So these are the five hindrances, right? The, the lust and greed, right? And the wish and desire for something that is pleasant, that is karma chanda. And then the anger, the hatred, the ill will towards things that are unpleasant. That is Vyapada, sometimes spelled with a B. So it's Vyapada or Vyapada. And at the same time, we experience this uh, restlessness. The mind is uh, restless. It's a lot of thoughts running around like a monkey mind. And that is Udacha Kukucha, restlessness. On the other extreme, there is this dullness of the mind, the weakness of the mind, the lethargic mind, the lethargy, Tina Mida the mind gets into a drowsy state. And sometimes we fall asleep as a result of that. All right? So that is Dina Mina. And when all this is happening, it is creating a lot of Vichikicha. Vichikicha actually is a cognitive dissonance, meaning the mind is being disturbed that it is not able to discern what is good from bad. So the mind is perplexed. The mind is vacillating. That means it is not able to, to make a clear decision what is the right thing to do or how to move forward. So this is a state of vacillation. I will explain a bit more about Vichikicha later on. Right? For the most of this sharing, we are really focusing on Udacha Kukucha and Tina Mida because these are the conditions that lead to us experiencing the hypnagogic effect. I will talk about that in a moment. So again, we come back to this, and here it is very clear that bhavana is about making our mind remaining conscious, at the same time taming and stilling the emotional mind. So now let's take a look at one of the important sutra, because the first part of meditation that helps us still the emotional mind, that means calm our mind. This is really samatha meditation. When we are able to bring our mind to a state of stillness, then we're able to see and discern realities, and that is entering into vipassana. But we won't be talking about vipassana for now. We're basically focusing on this process of samatha. Now, in this sutra, tatiya samatha, Tatiya Samadhi Sutra in Anguttara Nikaya Book of Fours. The Buddha was describing there are basically four types of meditators. First, there are those who are able to cultivate Samatha, but not Vipassana. Then there are those who are able to cultivate Vipassana, but not yet Samatha. Then there are those who are not able to cultivate either. And then, the fourth category are those who are able to cultivate both samatha and vipassana. Here, in this, in this part of the sutra, I'm referring to the part where the Buddha was referring to those who are able to cultivate vipassana, but not samatha. And the Buddha's advice is that people who are able to cultivate vipassana, but not develop their samatha, should then seek the people who are able to develop Samatha and learn from them how is the process to develop this Samatha. So the Buddha mentioned there are four stages of this development of Samatha. First, the Buddha said it is about bringing the Chitta uh, to become steady, steadying the Chitta. Now, steadying the Chitta is uh, maybe one of the easy way to describe it is let's say the Chitta is this emotional mind. It is always running around. So you imagine a person who is running. 
right? So if this person is busy running around, right, he's restless and he's all kinds of activity going on, steadying means stop running, stand still, stop, don't run. So basically, from running to a state of standing, that is really what is meant by steadying the chitta. The second stage is then settling the chitta, right? Settle down the chitta. So what is the meaning of settle down the chitta? So when from running, you are now standing, then the next more calm state, that means the calmer, the calmer state, more calm than standing is sitting down. So this settle down is tentatively similar to that person having running, then stopping, and finally sitting down. So this is really what is meant by settle down. Then at this point, the chitta becomes still, begins to still, it becomes very still. So as it enters into stillness, then the third one is to be unified. Unified with what? The chitta becomes unified with mano. The two minds are no longer uh, in conflict. The two minds are now becoming one. They come together as one. So in other words, there is no more differentiation between what is chitta, what is mano. The two are now one. Basically, the chitta has become stilled. The chitta is no longer active. They're no longer disturbing the mano. So now the two are unified. So this is the third part. And when the two are unified, then the whole thing comes into a state of equilibrium. And this is uh, the fourth part. Now here, I'm using very popular translation. This translation is by Tanisaro Bhikkhu. In fact, even Bhikkhu Bodhi uses the same, same translation, where they're referring to the word samadhi as concentration. Samadhi is not really concentration. We cannot say it's concentrated. It's not bringing the mind to a state of being concentrated. It is bringing the mind to a state of mental equilibrium. The mind is so still and so at peace, so balanced, that there is no conflict going on. It is perfectly balanced in harmony. And when a mind is in that state, then it is able to see very distinctly what is going on? It's like, uh, I'll show you this bottle of water. Imagine this is the mind. Normally, it is shaking. Okay? So, from there, you want to steady it. What is steadying that you stop shaking it? Right? So, when it is steady, then what is settling down? Settling down is putting it down on the table so that now it's, it, it becomes still. And when it has settled down, now... The whole bottle is perfectly still. And then mental equilibrium means when the bottle of water is perfectly still, you can see inside what is inside that bottle of water. Because when it is shaking, you can't see what's going on inside. Right? So it's still in the mind so that you can see very clearly what is inside this bottle. You can see every speck of dirt, every single bubble every whatever inside, seeing clearly. And it is only when you are able to reach that state of mental equilibrium are you then able to experience vipassana, to see and discern clearly. So this is really talking about stilling the mind and this mental equilibrium. Right? So that is what is meant by samadhi. It's mental equilibrium. So I will let Bhante explain to you uh, this process of mental equilibrium. There is always something pulling something in this world. And therefore, to be remaining still means it is in balance somehow. That is why it is equilibrium. Equilibrium means the pulls are in an equal state. This is only the tranquility comes. So this is why it is very important to understand that samadhi is not concentration. Most people translate it as concentration. 
Samadhi is not concentration, it is a state of mental equilibrium. Now when you reach that state of mental equilibrium, that is called entering the jhana. Entering the jhana. And what is the meaning of jhana? Now again, a lot of people think jhana is a state of concentration. Jhana is not concentration. Jhana is what is called a withdrawal. We now if I go out of this room and stay at the door outside. That is called standing out. That standing out is called ecstasy. The word ecstasy is usually understood as are getting excited, it is not getting excited, it is standing out of all excitement. That means calming the mind. All the emotional excitement, you are getting out of it. That is standing out. So, you are withdrawing from the world of emotional excitement. It's a withdrawal and standing out. So the first ecstasy is to stand out of the emotional world. So now you know samadhi is mental equilibrium. Now, if we do not, uh, if we are not able to reach that state of mental equilibrium, we have to be careful, right? When it is in that state of mental equilibrium, the mind can then enter into jhana. And Bhante Punaji uh, translates the word jhana as ecstasy. He will explain later on the meaning of ecstasy. But basically, it is important to distinguish this state of stillness where you're experiencing the jhana and this hypnotic state because there's a very, very subtle difference. If you're not careful, your mind could go into hypnotic state and how can it enter into hypnotic state? It is when you become, when you concentrate too much. That's why samadhi is not concentration. When you try to concentrate then your mind gets tired. When the mind exerts too much effort and becomes concentrated, then it gets very tired. It experiences restlessness. And this state of restlessness is udacha kukucha. And when the mind is tired and going through this state of restlessness, sooner or later, it falls into a state of weakness, right? Lethargy, getting tired, getting drowsy. And all that eventually leads you to a hypnotic state. So you have to be careful about that. And it is this, uh, it is a, this state of mind that is halfway between, be, be, between awake and asleep. I will explain more later about this hypnotic state. Okay? And we have to be careful because this process of lethargy and drowsiness, right, is sometimes mistaken as jhana because the, the mind is falling into a state of drowsiness and then you start to think, oh, it's so peaceful, but actually you're, you're about to fall asleep. You're halfway between uh, awake and asleep. Actually, there is a type of meditation that takes you there. It's called transcendental meditation. 
I'm going to explain briefly what that is later on. So in that state, it is actually not jhana, but you, you can easily mistake it as jhana. So you have to be very careful with your meditation practice. So this hypnagogic effect, what is it? Now, if we do not remain consciously attentive to our mental conditioning when meditating, we may experience this hypnagogic effect. That means the, the, the mind begins to slow down. As the mind slows down, it falls into a state of lethargy and drowsiness. And that is really the, the, the anusayam begin to arise. This repressed memory begin to arise. And that can help, uh, that can create hallucinations, imaginations, and even leading to delusions. And people can even think that they are falling into jhana, that they are now experiencing jhana. And there are even people I have come across, you know, I have spoken to people who experience this, but they don't realize it. You know? And then they start to think that they are enlightened. I have even come across people who claim they are enlightened. They say they are enlightened because they have gone, they have this experience. Right? So they are really experiencing this, uh, this self-hypnosis, the delusion of enlightenment. We have to be very careful also. So there is really very little that separates this meditative state and the hypnotic state. I, later on, I am going to explain about how the brain waves will show you the difference between meditative state and hypnotic state. Right? They're completely different in the brain. But from your perception of the mind, it appears to be the same, but it's not. In the brain, it is completely different, which I will show later on. So we need to now look at the workings of the brain. So let's go into this neurological basis of consciousness. All right. So... Basically, what is going on in this brain? The brain has evolved over millions of years into three major layers. The innermost layer is what is called the brain stem. This is the oldest part of the brain, and this is the part of the brain that is responsible for our survival. Uh, it is uh, governing our respiration, our cardiovascular system, our digestive system, and so on. So it's basically keeping us alive. That's why it's called the survival brain. In the middle layer is the limbic system. Now, this is commonly called the emotional brain. This is the part of the brain that is responsible for chain reaction that triggers the release of hormones and, and biochemical reactions in the body. And all these biochemical reactions in the body begin to disturb the body. And when the body is, is being disturbed, the mind is disturbed. See, the, there's, uh, the body affects the mind, the mind affects the body, right? So when, when there is disturbances in the body, tensions in the body, right? Irritations in the body, discomfort in the body, it disturbs the mind. So this is really what is called the emotional mind. The limbic system is the remote emotional mind. Then in the outermost layer is this cerebral cortex. And this is normally called the learning brain or the thinking part, right? the thinking part of the mind. So all the activities in this cerebral cortex really is the activity that is experienced as thinking, right? So that's why we call it the thinking mind. It's the result of the activity of this. Actually, there's also a whole lot of other parts of the body that is affecting the thinking, but the prim primary part is all the neural, neural networks that are being fired up in the cerebral cortex that gives us this experience of thinking. Right? So that's why I'm using the word think mind and brain interchangeably here, but they are not really the same thing. The mind is not the brain, the brain is not the mind, but the activities of the brain leads to the experience of the mind. Let me repeat that. The activity of the brain, and it's not only the brain, but also the rest of the body. So the activity of, we call this the central nervous system, the brain and the body. So it's the activity of the central nervous system that leads to the experience of the mind. 
So in other words, we begin to have this consciousness and we begin to have this awareness and we begin to have this thinking and thoughts. All this is because of the activity that's going on in the cerebral cortex as well as other parts of the brain and also the rest of the body. So the activity of the central nervous system is the experience of the mind. So now we talk about the emotional uh, brain. That part of the brain we call the emotional brain. This is the limbic system. Uh, deep inside this emotional command center is a little structure called the amygdala. The amygdala is scanning all sensory inputs. Everything we see, hear, smell, taste, or touch passes through the amygdala first. So the amygdala is very reactive to everything we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. So when it senses something that seems a little bit disturbing or irritating or unusual, the amygdala gets aroused. And when the amygdala is aroused, it, it, it then triggers a chain reaction. This is really, the purpose of this is to protect us from harm. And this chain reaction makes us feel, experience this thing called fight or flight reaction. Like this is because of hormones being released in the body. So this part of the brain triggers a chain reaction that releases hormones in the body, causing bodily discomfort and all kinds of bodily reaction. And that is really disturbing the mind. And this is really the fight or flight reaction. But this is evolved to protect us from harm. Right? So that's why it's called the bodyguard. But the, the brain, this part of the brain has a paradoxical role. It can also be easily aroused. So arousing emotions of fear, panic, anger, anxiety, and so on, that leads to unnecessary arousal of emotions. So therefore, when the brain, when this part of the brain is unnecessarily aroused, the amygdala becomes the terrorist in the brain. So the amygdala actually has a paradoxical role. It is both a bodyguard as well as a terrorist. Right? So it is this that causes a lot of disturbances because the body is this uncomfortable. There's a lot of tensions in the body and the mind gets disturbed. That's really what emotion is all about. Disturbing disturbances of the mind as a result of all kinds of bodily discomfort. You know, when, what is fear? When you see something, you experience fear because there is this shock in the body. Then there's goosebumps, goose pimples. All these are bodily reaction, and that leads to an emotional state called fear. The same with anger. Your blood pressure rises and your whole body gets heated up. That is anger, right? So all these are physiological reactions in the body that leads to the emotional states. Now we talk about vichikicha. Vichikicha has been translated as skeptical doubt, but it's really not skeptical doubt. Pandipunaji very precisely translate this as cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means the mind is being torn in two opposite directions, like dissonance. Dissonance means being torn in two directions. Right? So feeling, emotions, and thinking, uh, reasoning are pulling in opposite direction. That is vichikicha. So Perplexity, it leads to perplexity. That means we begin to get a little bit confused. It leads to indecisiveness. We are not able to decide right from wrong. And it leads to stress. The body is, is now getting tensed up. Distress, the mind is getting disturbed. So stress is the bodily reaction. Distress is the mental reaction. And confusion, you begin to... Con become more and more confused about what's going on. And because of the confusion, you begin to have doubt. The mind is in turmoil. The mind is not stable. The mind is not steady, not, not uh, at peace. And that's why you begin to have doubt. So Vichikicha is really not specifically skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt is actually the, the effects of Vichikicha. Vichikicha is perplexity, indecisiveness, stress and distress, confusion, the mind in turmoil, the collective effects of all this. That is vichikicha, the mind being torn in different directions. So feeling our emotions pull in one direction and then 
reasoning, the thinking part, pulls in the other direction. Now I'm going to go into a very interesting thing about how the brain works between wakefulness and drowsiness. Before we go that, I want you to take a look at this picture. Now I'm going to expand this picture. Just give me a second while I expand this picture. All right. Okay. Now this is what I want you to do. I want you to look at this picture and see whether you can see the face and together with the words and focus on both at the same time. Are you able to focus on the face and the words at the same time? Lea Salonga. By the way, Lea Salonga is a very famous singer in the Philippines. Uh, she was the, at 18 years old, she became the star in this uh, musical called Miss Saigon and became world famous. And now she's in her late 40s. Right? Okay, so can you see her face and her name at the same time? No, you can't. Now, some people will say, oh, the face is one thing, the word is another, so we can't see the two together. All right, now let's look at something closer. Look at her face and see the two eyes. Now, can you focus on both her eyes at the same time? Look clearly. Be very mindful. Observe. Are you able to focus on both her eyes at the same time? No, you can't. Now, some people might say, oh, because the eyes are a little bit far apart. So how about something very close? Okay. Take a look at her two front teeth. Right? She has beautiful front teeth. Look at the two largest front teeth. Can you focus on both her front teeth at the same time? No, you can't. Your, your eyes, right? Uh, just give, give me a second. Your eyes are darting back and forth between the two front teeth, right? Just like your eyes are darting between the two eyes, her two eyes, and your, your, your eyes are darting between the face and the words. We cannot even focus on two things side by side at the same time. If you don't believe me, let's try this experiment, all right? I have my two finger. Can you focus on both my fingers at the same time? No, you can't. I'm going to put the two fingers very close together. Can you now focus on both my fingers at the same time? No, you can't. I'll put them side by side. Are you able to focus sharply on both my fingers at the same time? No, you can't. Why? Your eyeball is starting back and forth. Now, the explanation can be very deep, but what is happening here is when your eyeball is darting back and forth, it is picking up bits and pieces of that image. Right, that bits and pieces, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You're picking up bits and pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, sending it to the brain to be processed. And the brain assembles it together and form the big picture. Right? So that is really what is going on. All these millions of signals between the eye darting back and forth are being brought to the brain and assembled together. And what is the brain trying to assemble? Okay, so if you look at the picture, what is happening is one part of the brain will be processing an overall outline, the shape, the overall shape of this image. Another part of the brain will be processing specific objects in the image, the eyes, the teeth, the nose, the hair. Another part of the brain is processing the colors, the yellow color, the black the gray, the pink, the, the orange, the white, right, the red. So the different colors are being processed by another part of the brain. And another part of the brain is processing the words. Right? And another part of the brain is processing the recognition of the meaning of the name, remembering the name. Oh, this person, I know this person. Another Part of the brain is processing facial recognition. Ah, this is the face of Leah Salonga. So there's a lot of different parts of the brain processing the whole image. And all this processing needs somehow to be synchronized together. Right? So there is a way 
to measure this activity in the brain. And the way to measure it is uh, we are really measuring brain waves. It is these brain waves that help various different parts of the brain synchronize all the different processing going on. Synchronizing so that now we can become aware of the full image, the full big picture of the face of that beautiful lady called Leah Salonga and the complete picture. Just as we now see this complete picture of Matthew Ricard sitting there with all these uh, probes in, uh, around the head, measuring his brain waves, and then able to read the word brain waves and have meaning given to this complete picture. So many different parts of the brain come together. They are processing, they become synchronized, right? There is no controller, it's all synchronized. And this synchronization is, can only happen when the certain brain waves are operating at a high enough frequency. So when the brain waves slow down, it won't synchronize. It becomes more synchronized when the brain waves go up. And this brain wave is just the layman's term for what is called synchronous oscillatory frequency. And this can be measured using electroencephalography, right? And that's what's happening to Matthew Ricard. All these uh, probes are measuring the EEG going on inside his nervous system, like right? the brain as well as various nerves in, in the body all the activities, right? So this synchronization. Let's listen to a very well-known scientist, Wolf Singer. He is, uh, he is the uh, director of the Max Planck Institute for Brain Research, where he's explaining about this synchronization. And he's then explaining there is no central commander. And because there is no central commander controlling all this, it, then he says there's no seat of the self. All the different parts of the brain are working independently, and yet, because of the brain waves, a higher brain wave, they are able to synchronize. So let's listen to his brief explanation during one of those Mind and Life Society uh, conferences where he was explaining to the Dalai Lama this process of synchronous uh, uh, oscillatory uh, frequency, synchronous oscillatory frequency going on, the brain waves, okay? Now, modern brain research designs a completely different picture of the organization of our brain. If we had a picture, you would now see um, <laughs> areas of the cerebral cortex, about a hundred of them, which are interconnected very, very intensively, one with the other. But there is no evidence for a conversion center or for a pyramidal hierarchical organization. These areas, they deal with very different inputs, like from the eye, from the ear, from the touch senses. And then there are areas which um, belong to the so-called limbic system, which attach emotional connotations to the contents of conscious experience. So there is no, no single place in the brain where an observer could be located or a, a command structure could be implemented or where the self could have its seat. It's a highly distributed system in which many, many functions occur simultaneously and there is no coordinator, they self-organize. So, there is no coordinator, no observer, no seat of the self. So you have heard what uh, Dr. Wolf Singer was saying. Now let's go through his statements. Basically, he said that a hundred areas in the cerebral cortex right? Basically, the, the various part of the thinking brain, a hundred areas of them, they are interconnected in the sense that they, they have uh, all the nerves, neurons interconnecting different areas in the brain, different parts of the brain in this cerebral cortex, the thinking brain. And 
they are intensely interconnected. There is no evidence that there is a convergence center. In other words, there is no evidence that there is something that is controlling everything. There is no pyramidal hierarchical organization. Pyramidal hierarchical organization means it's like a, like a pyramid. There is something right on top and everything falls below. There is no such thing in the brain. We think that this thinking brain is it. No. The thinking brain is responsible for only certain functions. It does not control everything. Uh, we can make decisions and our decisions can lead to actions and actions may cause certain influences to how we think and how we act. But there is no uh, central hierarchical system. There is no pyramidal hierarchical organization going on in the brain. It's all distributed. So areas, then he, he, referred, he referred to the emotional brain. In the emotional brain, it is also participating in this interconnectivity. So areas in the limbic system, the emotional brain, attach emotional connotations to conscious experience. Meaning inside the emotional brain, it begins to uh, react in such a way we begin to have certain emotions about what we are experiencing consciously. Whether we like something, we don't like something. That is our emotional uh, responses. And there is no single place in the brain that, has, that an observer is located or a command structure exists or where a self could have its seat. This is a very important statement. Uh, this is a, a top-notch scientist making such a statement, very clear. No single part in the brain that is an observer. In other words, there is no one part of the brain that is able to oversee everything that's going on in the brain. Right? We know that. We don't know what's going on. Right? We really don't know what's going on inside all this. So, and there is no command structure. Right? There's no referee. There is no monitor, no supervisor. And there is no, because of all that, there is no seat of the self. In other words, there's no part of the brain that seem to, to have this identity we call the self. This is a very important finding here. Scientists are saying that there is no seat of the self, and this is a top-notch scientist. Right? And Dr. Wolf Singer is really the director emeritus of Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. And he went on to summarize and conclude. The brain is a highly distributed dynamical system that has no convergence center, meaning there is no one place everything comes together and there is no one place that is in charge, so to speak. There is no coordinator, there is no observer, and there is no seat of the self. So there you have it. Top-notch scientist has come to this conclusion from years of decades of research and say that there is no part of the brain that seem to behave like there is a self doesn't exist so all these brain waves right now we're going to take a look at the brain waves these brain waves define our consciousness if the brain wave is high high frequency we are more alert if the brain waves slow down low frequency, we become drowsy and groggy. So let's take a look at these levels of consciousness. So when we talk about this synchronous oscillatory frequency or brain waves, it is measured in terms of hertz. Hertz means cycles per second. So when we are normally conscious, and I assume all of you are in this state of mind right now, between 13 to 30, right? You're not falling asleep, right? So between this range, we are conscious. And in the lower range, around 13 to 20, around that range, we are just clearly aware. So it's conscious awareness, simply aware. So if you're just observing, you're just aware, then your brain wave is around there. But if your brain wave starts to go up to a higher frequency, your consciousness become more critical, more alert. 
then you become more discerning. Your mind becomes sharper. So the higher the frequency, the sharper your mind is. That's really what's going on. Now, this state of consciousness is called the beta state. Right? They're using these terms to refer to a state of consciousness. So beta is referring to the state of normal consciousness. Then when we look at what go, comes below beta, okay? So below beta, it goes into alpha. And this is when the brain waves slow down, falling below 13 hertz, down to 8 hertz. So somewhere between 8 to 13, your mind is falling into a state of lethargy, grogginess, drowsiness, semi-consciousness. That's why it's called subconsciousness. So this is a state where you're not alert, where you are no longer clearly aware of what's going on. You're groggy, drowsy. You could say when you are experiencing Tina Mida, you are in that state. And some, are, I hope you are, some of you are not in that state. So when you are listening to a lecture and you start to doze off and you start not to pay attention, your mind is falling into that state, the alpha state. This is the semi-conscious state. It is near to sleep state. Now, if the brain waves slow down further, you are now falling into sleep state. At the higher end, we call them REM sleep, rapid eye movement. This is the state where you fall asleep and you are having dreams. That means the mind is still quite active, but you are in a sleep state. And this activity of the mind leads you to begin to have all kinds of thoughts while sleeping. This all kinds of thoughts while sleeping, we call it dream. So that is the REM sleep where you have, you're full of dreams. That is called the theta state. The theta state refers to the state of sleep where you, it is called REM sleep and you have dreams. But if your brain waves slow down, down to very slow, four hertz is very slow, four cycles per second, it's down to that very slow brain, then you are into deep sleep. In deep sleep, it is called short wave sleep, SWS, short wave sleep. In deep sleep, this is delta sleep. In delta, you don't have dreams. You are deep in sleep. And when you wake up from delta sleep, wow, that sleep is so peaceful, so wonderful, because there is no activity in the mind. So therefore, you are very rested, restful sleep. Peaceful, uh, it's a very peaceful sleep. So that's really what is going on. So in the blue part is consciousness. The yellow part is drowsiness. The red part is sleep. Now, when the brain waves go higher, then your mind becomes very sharp. That is when the brain waves go past 30, starting to approach 40. When it reaches 40, that is what is called gamma. So gamma state refers to the state of mind where the brain wave is oscillating at 40 or higher. And there, your mind is very, very sharp. It is in a state of introspection, meaning it is able to bring the mind inwards and observe and inspect and discern what's going on inside. And if it goes above that, then it is into a state called apperception. Right? So how do we reconcile this drowsiness and, and wakefulness with Meditation. Now, we have to be aware there is a cutoff point called the critical factor. Below this critical factor, the mind is not sharp. So in other words, when you are barely aware and conscious, where the brain wave is between 13 to 20, roughly, you are what we call below critical factor. Even in that state of consciousness, you're not very sharp. You're just aware of what's things that are happening, but you are not able to discern very clearly what is what in a very precise way. As it falls further down, then you're falling into hypnotic state. So in other words, hypnosis happens when the brain waves slow down to below 13. And that's when 
your mind is operating in this semi-conscious state. We call it unconscious awareness. Because you might be aware, you may have seen certain objects, but you're not really conscious about it. You're not thinking about it. You're not paying attention anymore. You're groggy. And that is the beginning of hypnotic state. And hypnosis goes in right into the REM sleep. Right? So hypnosis, deep hypnosis is your mind starts to enter into REM sleep state, the theta state. So that is hypnosis. Now you have to be careful. If you start to chant and have this mantra-based meditation, right? thinking of certain objects, thinking, right? not observing, thinking of certain objects when you try to meditate, you could fall into that state. So you have to be careful. Chanting meditation can lead you into hypnotic state if you are not clearly discerning what you're chanting. In other words, if you are not critically alert about what you're chanting, then chanting meditation can lead you into hypnosis, right? this hypnotic state. Same with mantra-based meditation. That means your mind begins to imagine certain objects and you want to now think about certain objects. And this is very, you have to be very careful because some people think that that is vipassana. No, you are imagining it. You begin to imagine that uh, your, 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 your digestive system or working like anicca, you can't see what's going on in your digestive system. So you can't imagine what's going on down there. You can't see what's going on inside your lungs. How can you imagine the air flowing around your lungs? You can't really experience that because there are no uh, touch senses, touch, uh, you know, touch nerves to be able to sense what's going on inside your lungs. You can't experience that, right? So don't try to imagine it. Don't imagine air flowing through your lungs because that is really leading you into hypnotic state. And some people think that is uh, vipassana, but it is not. So what then is Buddhist meditation? Above that, above the critical factor, that cutoff point. When the brain waves rise above that, Right? So the mind becomes sharp and clearly observing, critically alert and observing. Observing as you breathe in, it is a long breath. As you breathe out, it is a short breath. So all this observing. And then as you observe the, the breathing process that is going on, you begin to calm the body down. So that is samatha meditation. When you practice anapanasati, so that is samatha meditation. And as your mind becomes more and more still, right? It, it becomes very sharp. And stillness of the mind doesn't mean the, 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 the mind is in a groggy state. No. Stillness of the mind is when the mind is so sharp, it is able to stand still and see something very clearly, critically alert, right? And that stillness, leads you into introspection. And that is what Vipassana meditation is about. So the lesson here is you have to be careful, right? Importantly is don't use chanting meditation. If you really want to remain uh, critically alert. Now, some chants are okay. You know, like sometimes they, uh, they say Budo. They just say Budo and as you, as you, as you meditate. Right? So when you, when you chant the name of the Buddha, right? or if you are now basically uh, recollecting the virtues of, virtues of the Buddha, that is Buddha Nusati, then it is into Samatha meditation. Right? You're not, you have to be careful when you do Buddha Nusati, recollections of the Buddha, don't do it like a, uh, how should I put it? Don't do it like a, a sort of a simply, simply doing it because then you may fall into this uh, drowsiness. Right? Be critically alert. Be aware. What, are, what virtues of the Buddha are you now recollecting? Clearly discerning which virtue of the Buddha are you recollecting? And then you will not fall into that uh, below the critical factor. 
to remain above the critical factor is what Bhante Punaji says, to be conscious. So when you practice Buddhanusati or Dhammanusati, right, the, the various teachings of the Buddha, right, then you have to be very critically alert. What is it that you are observing? Right? So I hope that is now very clear. So that leads you into Satipatthana, Satipatthana and leads you into Satabhujanga eventually to Upeka. This is the fourth jhana. Right? Now, I mentioned about uh, this uh, thing called meditation. Transcendental meditation is actually a meditation where you are given a mantra. That means a certain object to think about. And when your mind is focused on that object, your mind falls into a state of uh, stillness. But that stillness is not critical alertness. That stillness is basically the mind slowing down. So therefore, transcendental meditation is really allowing this mind to slow down, falling into lower brain waves, going into this uh, subconscious state. So that really is a form of self-hypnosis. So in a nutshell, Transcendental meditation is no different from self-hypnosis. So you have to be careful what you, when you Google and try to find out what is meditation, then transcendental meditation is basically a form of self-hypnosis. So don't try to learn from these scientists who talk about transcendental meditation. They will teach you how to end up in self-hypnosis. So now let's take a look at Buddhist meditation. And if you really want to Google, the foremost authority in researching the brain activities of, uh, uh, in Buddhist meditation is this scientist by the name of Richard Davidson. He has been doing it for several decades, four decades already. He started uh, working with the Dalai Lama, with the permission of the Dalai Lama, he started to work with the Tibetan monks, and he then branched on to working with many other uh, Buddhist uh, meditators. And one of his prime subjects sitting right on his right-hand side uh, is Matthew Ricard. Okay? So you can see here, he's explaining to uh, Dalai Lama about this gamma range, how the brain waves goes into this gamma range. Uh, in our work with long-term uh, Buddhist meditation practitioners, we found that meditation is associated with marked increases in electrophysiological signs of activation, specifically in the gamma frequencies. These are high frequencies in the brain um, electrical recordings. And particularly in the prefrontal cortex, which we see as important for certain aspects of regulating emotion. So you just heard uh, Richard Davidson explain about Buddhist meditation in the gamma range. And he basically stated, meditation is associated with marked increases in electrophysiological signs of activation in the gamma range, in the prefrontal cortex, right? and the synchrony between the prefrontal cortex and other regions of the brain in long-term practitioners. Let's examine this slowly. Huh? Meditation is associated with marked increases in electrophysiological signs. Electrophysiological signs, he was referring to brain waves, EEG, the measurement of EEG. And so this increase right, approaches this gamma range. So the, the, the uh, electrophysiological signs, the EEG, rises up to this gamma range in the prefrontal cortex. So when such a meditator is able to meditate to that point, right, then the, the brain wave will help this gamma range, this EEG in the gamma range will help to synchronize everything, uh, the, the whole of the brain. So the prefrontal cortex with the rest of the brain, synchronizing, not controlling, synchronizing. And bear in mind, he was referring to long-term practitioners. So meditating and raising this brainwave to the gamma range is not something easily done. It takes years of practice. Right? 
some people might might be able to do it uh, in a uh, faster some people might take longer how fast well hard to say right there is no way of saying uh, how fast you can train yourself to meditate into this gamma range some people might be meditating for years and decades and never able to do that right basically if you're doing it with the right technique you can do that so that is really about brain waves and staying in the highly critically alert state of mind right? that is the meditative state of mind where the mind enters into jhana and not in this drowsy state of mind okay so this gamma range is that high frequency prefrontal cortex is our thinking brain in the front and it is able to synchronize all parts of the brain together and this only happens when you have been practicing for a long time not something that is easily happening in new uh, practitioners okay. so in summary like right, falling below critical factor would be hypnosis and transcendental meditation as well as this chanting meditation and mantra meditation so you have to be careful if you're using mantra or you are doing chanting you have to stay critically alert then it goes in the higher range that is what buddhist meditation is all about sustained focused attention introspective awareness withdrawn from sensory objects that means not thinking about what you see here smell taste or touch withdrawn from memory not allowing the memory to pop up okay withdrawn from imagining things all right withdrawn from having any kind of expectations so i hope there are plenty of tips here okay so how do we know we're falling into hypnotic state the signs are firstly drowsiness right sleepiness it may be minor in the beginning or trivial but it can get worse so when you start to experience drowsiness that is a starting state already or any sign of emotional arousal or excitement such as experiencing pleasure or displeasure uh, you you feel that oh this body is very comfortable ah this body is so uncomfortable pleasures displeasures then you 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 start to experience any kind of emotional states fear anger frustration so on or any sign of tensions in the body physiological reactions hormonal changes in the body some parts of the body getting tense some parts of the body uh, shaking right so various experiences in the body and your breathing getting faster right and your heart is beating faster your muscles are getting tensed up neck and shoulders right and another sign is that the mind begin to interact and engage in the mental objects if you're observing your breath then you begin to think oh this breath is very comfortable oh wow this breath is flowing through my lungs you're beginning to imagine you cannot really sense the breath going through the lungs you can only sense comfort in the lungs you cannot sense that how this air is flowing through your lungs so if you begin to imagine that then you could fall into hypnosis what do you do straighten your back the first thing you should do is learn how to straighten your back okay now when you begin to experience these signs of uh, falling into hypnotic state how do you recover okay so you need to reset your meditation basically recover from it and if you are doing sitting meditation basically we're talking about sitting meditation so stop doing sitting meditation immediately get up don't don't keep sitting because after straightening your back and you're still falling into this drowsiness and whatever then stop because the more you sit there try that you you are fighting it it gets worse so just get up and go wash your face right one thing is go wash your face if you're feeling a bit drowsy after washing your face come back and continue if you want to or better still take a walk or even better than that do walking meditation right so you alternate between sitting and walking meditation so always alternate between sitting and walking don't try to sit for too long 
once you begin to experience these signs, you, you must then break and do walking meditation. Right? And when you are able to take, your, take that break, then you can resume your sitting meditation when you are ready. Avoid doing sitting meditation when you are physically tired or exhausted or shortly after taking meals. You see, what happens is when you take meals, the food in your stomach, so what happens? Digestion is going on. And, in, and this digest, digestive system is autonomous. It works by itself. You can't control it. So when this digestion is going on, it draws a lot of energy from your, your whole body in order to sustain this digestive system going on, digesting your food. Drawing energy meaning that it is drawing so much energy that there is not enough energy flowing to the brain. So in other words, it is drawing so much energy, there's not enough energy flowing to the brain, and then your brain gets drowsy. Right? So therefore, avoid doing any sitting meditation within one to two hours after taking a meal. Minimum one hour, one to one and a half hours minimum. Better still two hours after taking meal. So if you had your dinner at seven or eight o'clock, you shouldn't be meditating before 10 o'clock. Otherwise, you will start to, to experience all kinds of, of drowsiness. Right? There's a the possibility of experiencing drowsiness. So I hope that tip has been useful. And in summary, basically, we're talking about developing the conscious mind. And that is what meditation is trying to do. And by developing this conscious mind, you're able to tame and still your emotions when you remain uh, critically alert. Right? Otherwise, you fall into hypnotic state. And some of the benefits of practicing meditation, regardless of which teacher you follow or what methods you use, if you just learn to sit there and quiet down and allow your body to, to come to a state of restfulness and just let your mind uh, slow down a bit, you will experience all these benefits, slowing down the heart rate, improving blood circulation, lower the blood pressure, enhancing your immune system, calming your anger, fear, anxiety, so that they don't arise, relieving depressive moods. You will feel a little better if you're able to just calm down. Now, if you follow a good teacher or if you're able to practice with good techniques, then you are able to tame your lust, your hatred, and your delusion, the, tr the three poisons. Then you're able to abandon the five hindrances. Then if you're able to abandon the five hindrances, your mind will then go into a state of jhana. You're able to cultivate this systematic introspection, satipatthana. And then you can bring your mind to a state of mental equilibrium, stillness of mind, developing this mental equilibrium. This is called cognitive consonance, where the mind is now still. Right? This is mental equilibrium of the mind, samadhi. And then you are able to investigate cognitive experiences. And this is Dhamma Vichaya, part of the practice of Vipassana in the Sata Bojanga. And then you begin to discern. You're able to attain this insight into realities, being able to discern very clearly Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. And with that, you will then develop insightful wisdom, full comprehension into the true realities of what life is all about. Anicca, you have full, deep uh, comprehension of Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. So that is insight. And then you will learn how to free yourself from suffering. Now you are at the doorstep of liberation. And you are now, the next thing that will happen is you can become enlightened. Right? So vibhuti, the freedom from suffering. Liberation, emancipation, and deliverance from all suffering by basically abandoning all your defilements. So I hope this has been helpful. It brings us to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for joining us. Once again, just to remind you to download this uh, presentation file if you want. You can then look through all the slides. And if you have questions, please post them now. If you think about questions later on, you can always contact me. So please feel free to post all your questions now. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So let's now go into questions and answers. Welcome, Brother Hi. Billy. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the very, very informative talk. Uh, and I found the visual aids to be so, so helpful to understand, to gain a very deep understanding of the levels of consciousness. Yes. Um, Brother Billy, I think the. I'd like to thank you for the very, very Okay, I think it's, it's me. The Facebook Live. Okay. Turn off your Facebook Live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Um, okay, back. Back to where we were, back to the present moment now. Yes, uh, thank you for the very in insightful and very informative. Uh, talk. So we will start with the Q&A session now and uh, we have the very first question from our audience and this is the question Dear Brother Billy, in meditation at what stage is that when we are aware of breathing in and out and at the same time aware that different thoughts are popping up both happen at the same time and last for quite a while. It's a question by Yep Ling Wing. Okay, that is a good mm. question. Let me put up my slides. Mm. Okay. All right, I'll just jump through to the part oh, with the... Okay, this is the one. <clears throat> if we look at this chart here, when we are in normal awareness state, we are in the blue blue box right so it is that blue portion here conscious alertness uh, sorry conscious awareness and then when we become when our mind becomes very sharp it call it is called critical alertness now when we begin to meditate and we start observing the breathing conscious awareness is that state where we begin as we observe this uh, uh, the, the process of breathing uh, uh, things start popping up in our mind. Now, the popping up of uh, thoughts arising in the mind is the work of the chitta, the emotional brain. Whereas this conscious awareness, focusing on the process of breathing, that is actually our thinking mind, the mano. So in other words, at this time, the mano and the chitta are in conflict somewhat. So they, they are in conflict and because of that conflict, you will not be able to meditate peacefully. So you have to continuously maintain this conscious awareness. Every time thoughts pop up, you just let, let go the thought and focus back on observing the process of breathing. Now, I will use a, a metaphor, easy analogy. For example, if you are at home, Let's say you're cooking and then somebody rings the bell, ding dong, and then you know that you don't want to answer the, the doorbell because if you answer the doorbell, it's going to interrupt with your cooking. Your cooking is your conscious awareness, your conscious activity. So that's, then when the ding dong, that is the ding dong on the doorbell, that is your emotional brain trying to disturb you. So the whole idea is just let go and ignore the, the, the doorbell and just continue with your cooking and let the doorbell ring as much as they like. Now, if the doorbell keeps ringing after some time, nobody is answering because you are busy cooking, that means you're consciously observing your breathing. Sooner or later, whoever is trying to ring the bell will go away. These emotional thoughts arising are just merely visitors. They come, they go, they come, they go. They cannot stay unless you allow them. When you start to open your mind, uh, open the door, then you are interacting with your emotional thoughts, then you are allowing them to hang around. That is not good. Then you start to drift into the unconscious awareness part because you're no longer clearly conscious. So the whole idea is to maintain this consciousness. Right? So these uh, thoughts will keep popping up. Now, if you can maintain your consciousness continuously enough with, and just not even think about the doorbell ringing, not even think about the uh, emotional thoughts popping up, you can actually begin to move up from beta state to go up to the critical alertness and get above the critical factor. When your mind, when, when the brain waves are rising above the critical factor, 
whatever doorbell is ringing is you no longer get distracted All right so i i hope that basically answers uh, that question All right okay Okay, thank, thank you, Brother Billy. So, um, we move to the next question. Mm -hmm. And the next question is about the pitfall of meditation that you discuss, which is mm -hmm. self-hypnosis. Yes. Um, is it applicable to all meditations across the board with the exceptions of transcendental meditation and the chanting and mantra-based meditations? Uh, how about... Other focused attention meditations like the Himalayan yoga or other open monitoring meditations like the Zen and the Isha yoga, Shunya yoga and all. Okay, so let's go back to that slide. Can we not stop the, the slide? Okay. All right, so basically uh, what we have here, I'll move a bit further. Um, Sorry. Yeah, so there you go. What we have here, when we speak of these conscious meditation processes, so that is basically what Buddhist meditation is about, this conscious uh, meditation, the meditation based on consciousness. Whereas transcendental meditation is the meditation based on a mantra, imagining that then how the mantra can uh, slow you down, slow down the mind and help you relax. Now, I'm not criticizing transcendental meditation. Transcendental meditation has a very powerful benefit. People who are depressed, people who have anxiety disorders, people who are experiencing various kinds of maybe mild uh, depressions or mild uh, mental disorders, transcendental meditation can be very helpful because it helps you slow down your brain wave and brings your mind to a state of calm and peace. But this calmness is, does not make your mind sharp. It makes your mind dull. By dulling the mind, your mind is no longer disturbed by these uh, 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 depressive states, these depressive moods. But the other meditations that we talk about, all forms of Buddhist meditation are consciousness-based. So they are, uh, uh, they are making you focus more uh, and become more and more conscious and alert with your consciousness. And therefore, they are basically helping you to raise your brain waves. If you practice those long enough over a period of time, it uh, depends on how well you are instructed, how diligent you are at practicing, and the and conditions within which you are able to practice your meditation. You may take a matter of weeks before you can raise your brain wave to gamma state. But some people have been doing that for years and still not able to raise their brain waves into gamma state. It really depends on many things. It depends on your diligence, depends on the environment within which you are practicing your meditation, and depends on the, uh, the whoever is teaching you, guiding you. Right? So basically, all these other, all these other uh, consciousness-based meditations uh, are in that range. You have to develop this critical alertness, bringing the brainwave above that critical factor. And then you become more successful and you will experience the fruition. As the brainwave moves into the gamma, you know, uh, when the brainwave moves into the gamma range, that means your emotions are no longer disturbing you because when emotions are still disturbing you, that means the five hindrances are still active. When you're able to suspend the five hindrances, then you will be able to move the brainwave into the gamma range, and there you begin to experience jhanas. That's why it's so important to learn how to abandon and eventually suspend these five hindrances. I say suspend, I don't say eliminate, because only the arahant can completely eliminate all hindrances. The rest of us, even 
people who are uh, Sotapan or Sakadagami or even Anagami, there are still traces of five hindrances disturbing the mind. So therefore, it is, uh, it is only the Arahant who can completely eliminate five hindrances. So we are saying, uh, learn to abandon means learn to let it go. Every time it arises, let it go. So that is abandoning. And as you do that enough, eventually you will be able to suspend the five hindrances and your brainwave will start to move up. It, as soon as the five hindrances pop up, it drags your brainwave back down. It, it slows down your brainwave again because the brain will be too busy interacting with, uh, uh, with the emotions. And that's why we have to practice this consciousness. And if you remember in one of the slides, uh, Bhante Punaji, uh, I'll go back. Bhante Punaji was talking about consciousness. Um, the very beginning, I think. Yeah, uh, okay, very, uh, okay, never mind. So basically, it's about developing this consciousness. So it's important to develop your consciousness and sharpen it. And that is, you know, when, you, when your brain waves go into the gamma range, that's what Buddha calls luminous mind, the bright mind. That luminous mind means your mind is able to see clearly. It's like walking into a room that is lighted. You can see clearly what's inside the room. So you, that is the luminous mind, right? So I hope that uh, basically answers your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Brother Bidi. What I understood is that uh, this depends on the purpose of the meditation. So for Buddhist meditations like Samatha and Vipassana meditations, it's, con uh, it's consciousness-focused or consciousness-based yes. meditation. So we want to train our minds or our brains to, to move towards the gamma frequencies where we can get into introspection and move towards apperception which is the enhanced perceptual clarity. Um, so for other meditations, they may have different uh, purposes and that works for, for those who want to, to have those purposes. Uh, yeah, that's what I understood. Precisely. Mm -hmm. I want to add one slide which I didn't show, but it's in the downloaded PowerPoint slides. Uh, okay, I want to add this one. Yeah, this is a slide. You mentioned precisely, you, you hit the, the nail on the head, right on the thought, says, understand the purpose of meditation is really purification of the mind. That means developing this consciousness, pure consciousness. That is really how we purify the mind. When the mind is disturbed by emotions, it is not pure. So purification mind is developing this uh, critical consciousness. And the whole idea of meditation is not to enter into jhana states. Jhana states is just the fruition of your practice. So in other words, you should not think about, oh, I want to enter jhana state. That's why I'm meditating. If you start thinking like that, that's what happened. It's a desire. Mm. A desire is one of the five hindrances. The moment you have a desire, that's kamachanda. You're already engaging in one of the five hindrances. So any desire to experience jhana gives rise to this emotional arousal. It may arise while you're trying to meditate. And this arousal that you desire jhana, you may start to hallucinate you are entering into jhana states. So that is, uh, you know, that is how meditation gets destroyed when you start to, to have desires in your meditation. Just understand the purpose and let, let it go and don't hold on to it. Just practice it knowing, knowing in the back of your mind what you're doing is purifying your mind. And that's really all there is. And experiencing jhana will come when your practice bears fruit. So the whole important, is to, important thing is to practice diligently. Then you will experience the jhana. You don't have to specifically wish for that. That wish is not good. That wish itself is kama chanda, one of the five hindrances. You are allowing one of the five hindrances to stick in your mind. And then you will never be able to experience the fruition of your practice. So I hope that that answers your uh, your comment there. Right? Yes, that's very. And very maybe I should I should go on to say 
The next is not to have expectation, mm. expecting something to happen when you're meditating. Yeah. And there's a lot of people, I won't mention names, even very high level teachers are telling people, oh, you watch out for that Nimitta, thinking as though that Nimitta is like, you know, the, the rising sun. You can see a little dot in the distance and it gets brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. That explanation is not good because that is creating you to have these thoughts of imagining it. And then you start to expect what you're imagining. So expectation of any kind becomes repressed uh, memory. That's what uh, Bhante Punija was talking about, Anusayang, this repressed memory, because you have this, this expectation that is going to happen. So that expectation is silently sitting in the background, getting ready to rise. So and that when it starts to rise, it will create your imagination and hallucination. You're thinking that you are now entering, uh, seeing this nimitta, and this nimitta is telling you the whole truth and everything. That is all self-imagining. That is hypnotic state already. So the second part is don't have expectations. And of course, the final part is that all these are attention-based, consciousness-based, so always maintain conscious attention and introspection. Introspection comes from two root words. Intro means bringing in words. Spection comes from the word inspection. So bringing in words, observing what's going on inside. This observing is both applicable to samatha as well as vipassana. And so when you begin to observe what's going on, if you're just observing the process of breathing, that is samatha. But if you begin to observe this cognitive experience, how thoughts begin to arise, if we are able to observe that you are entering into vipassana. That is called dhamma vichaya, observing and investigating the cognitive experience. That is dhamma vichaya, one of the, uh, the second part of the seven steps to awakening, satabhujanga. So that dhamma vichaya is really the practice of vipassana. So that is introspection, bringing your attention inwards to observe what's going on. If you are just observing, that is samatha. If you begin to investigate this cognitive experience, dhamma vichaya, then that is vipassana. So you have to first maintain this conscious attention and the introspection at all times. When you are able to do that, that is like as though I, I mentioned the analogy earlier, you are busy, you are cooking. Mm. So you're not paying attention to the doorbell ringing. When you do that, you are deactivating the emotions arising. That means you, are, you don't even bother with the doorbell ringing. The emotions are knocking at the door. You don't even bother about it. You don't even say, go away. Don't do that. When you begin to say, go away, you are actually engaging with it. And that is not good. So don't even bother with it. Abandon it. Ignore it. Let it go. Right? Don't fight it. And that's how you deactivate this emotional thoughts arising, deactivating this uh, affective process, the chitta, and enable the necessary conditions that lead to unification of mind. If you remember earlier, I, spoke, I mentioned about those four stages of samatha. Right? Uh, we go back to that. That is very helpful, that slide, four stages of samatha. Oops, don't seem to have it here somehow. Yeah, it's much earlier. Never mind. The one about cultivating samatha. Um, yeah, being able that's to right. Cultivate samatha and not vipassana and being able to cultivate vipassana but not samatha. Yeah, that was the sutra that was talking about that. Yeah. That's so, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think I've covered all the points here here. So I have covered all the points here. And that's how in, you begin with unification of the mind. If you're not able to achieve unification of the mind, which means the chitta and the mano are still interacting and conflicting. If you're not able to unify the mind as one, you cannot succeed in practicing vipassana. Because as, soon, as long as the two minds are in conflict, you can never see the realities because the, the chitta, the emotional mind, the affective process will keep disturbing your consciousness and your attention. That's why this unification, the ekagata, is so important. Without doing that, you will never experience fruition from your vipassana practice.
Okay. So we have to be very mindful about whether we have any attachments uh, to the jhana, jhana stage and also um, whether we have expectations when it comes yeah. to meditation. This, or this is it. This, this slide tells it all. It's in the, mm -hmm. I added into the download. So you, when you download all the slides, you can, the new download, not the old one. Uh, now, if you download with the link now, then you will get this slide in there. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Brother Billy. We'll move to the next question, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So the next question is by Brother Wu. You explain, Brother Billy, you explain uh, the brain stem, the brain stem, which is the survival brain, mm -hmm. as the part of the brain that controls the activities, like breathing. Do we have any control over the activities of the brain stem? No. The brain stem, let's... Uh... Go to that slide if I can find it. See if it's there. Oh, somehow I missed that. Okay, never mind. Uh, the three parts of the brain, the brain stem, uh, just skip all this. Okay. Uh, the three parts of the brain, the oldest brain is the brain stem and um, that is how evolution started. Uh, okay, let me go back to the history of evolution. Life began in the water. So the first signs of living beings are the fish. They, that, the fish is the first sign of a living being. And the fish, the only brain in the fish, these are uh, very primitive fish species. They only have brain stem. And then gradually, the fish brain began to evolve and started to evolve the limbic system. The limbic system began to experience emotions and fear. And that is that fish species that start to evolve with limbic system, they start to fear their predators. And because of that, they try to swim towards the shore. And as they get onto the shore, they begin to try to get out of the water. Somehow they develop, the, the fins develop lakes and they are able to breathe air because those days, in, in that, those times, hundreds of millions of years ago, the air was very purely oxygen. And that's how they began to evolve into amphibians. Amphibians eventually evolved into reptiles. Reptiles went up the tree and then eventually evolved into mammals. And that is when the thinking brain starts to evolve. So during the time the fish start to get out of the water, the limbic system evolved until we become uh, mammals. And that's when the, the, the uh, thinking brain begins to evolve, cerebral cortex. That's why mammals have this cerebral cortex. They're able to think and uh, think. And birds also have some of this cerebral cortex. That's why even birds are known to be able to solve problems. So you can tell that the limbic system, we have, uh, sorry, the brainstem, we have no control over. Brainstem is basically govern governing all these uh, activities in the body. There are people, um, the yogas, there are people who have trained themselves to the extent that they can control certain autonomous functions in the body. What the brainstem is controlling is what we call autonomous functions. And what are autom autonomous functions? Digestion, respiration, uh, uh, breathing, right? and blood circulation, blood pressure. So what is happening is these people in, uh, who practice very high levels of yoga, they are not controlling the brainstem. They are controlling the organs. So they are really training their mind to control the muscles around the organ to, to control the organs. So people can actually control the breathing, but not because of controlling the brainstem. We can never control the brainstem. The brainstem cannot think. The brainstem is just a set of nerves that are governing the activities of these autonomous functions in the body. So they are really training, controlling muscles around the organs, muscles around the stomach, muscles around the digestive system, around the lungs, uh, around the diaphragm. So controlling their breathing, all this is training the mind to control the muscles. So on the questions of uh, controlling our, uh, controlling the brainstem, no, it's not possible. We cannot control 
the activities of the brain stem. We can only observe the breed, the process of breathing. I want to clarify one important point where a lot of people have uh, mistakenly think that Anapanasati is observing the breath. No, you are not observing the air. That is the breath. You are observing the process of breathing. And as you observe the process of breathing, you are able to observe whether the, the breathing is a long breath or the breathing is a short breath. And then you're able to observe how you can allow this activity, which is rhythmic, allow this rhythmic activity to pacify and calm the body down. So that is what Anapanasati is about, observing the process. And that is important because Pandit Purnaji was teaching us be experiential, not existential. So ex uh, observing the process is the process of experiential. Observing the breath is existential. So always maintain an experiential mindset. So I hope that answers that part of the, the brother's question. Okay. okay. Thank you, Brother Billy. So the next question we have is about hypnosis. So can you briefly explain to our viewers about hypnosis and also what is self-hypnosis and why do some people practice it? Okay, hypnosis, it, it basically comes from the root word hypnos. There's a Greek word hypnos. Hypnos means sleep. The god of sleep is uh, hypnos. So basically hypnosis came from that word. In the early days, when the people who started to discover this process of hypnosis, they are putting people into the state of sleepiness. That's why you see it, the brain wave slow down. So they're teaching people to slow down the brain wave. So it brings the brain wave to a state of unconscious awareness in the alpha state, drifting into the theta state. In that state, the mind is highly susceptible to suggestions. That's why, uh, that's how hypnosis works. Bring the brainwave to slow down. And when your brainwave slow down, you are no longer alert and critically aware or consciously aware what the hypnotist is trying to do to you. You are just allowing, the, letting the brainwave slow down, allowing the hypnotist to tell you, suggest to you what you should be doing. So the role of a hyp hypnotherapist is to suggest suggesting to the patient uh, what the patient should think about. So when people are feeling depressed, the, the hypnotherapist will then suggest to you, now focus on memory of your childhood where you are very happy and your mother was taking good care of you. You're so thankful to your mother, that wonderful feeling. So that's how hypnotherapy works. Get your mind to focus on memory of past that brought you a lot of happiness. And by doing so, it frees you from the depressive mood that you are experiencing uh, at that mo moment before the hypnotherapist started working on you. So actually, hypno hypnosis is basically suggest suggestions, suggestive thinking. Suggestive thinking, you can do it to yourself. That is called imagination. Someone can do it to you, and that is called redirection or suggestion. So that is the whole purpose of hypnosis, putting you into this drowsy state so that your mind becomes highly susceptible to suggestions. And that's why a lot of people, uh, especially motivational guru, they teach people this technique because they want you to, to suggest to yourself how to become very good, how to become better than who you are. That's how motivational gurus work. Right? They, they make suggestions so that uh, the subject or the patient starts to uh, suggest to himself, I am better than who I have been. I can do better than this. That's how people can become better. And that's how people get motivated from this kind of suggestion. So that's really the whole purpose of hypnosis and hypnotherapy. But of course, it can be misused as in any tool. It can be misused and abused by people and by con men who suggest to you, if you hand over your money, uh, you can double or triple your money. That's why you hear a lot of stories of people meeting a stranger and then handing over all their money and precious things because they are desirous of doubling their profits. Okay, so that's what hypnosis is really about. Suggestions. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, 
Brother Bidi. So we have come towards the, 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 the end of the Q&A session. Uh, before I start inviting you to, to uh, lead the sharing of merits, I thought I'll just wrap up very quickly, summarize some key points from the, the very, very informative talk today. Uh, so the first point we learned is that we have two minds. Mano, which is the thinking mind, and Chita, the emotional mind. And the five hindrances, which is the Pancha Nivarana, exists in our human experience. So it is natural for it for the meditation process to be disturbed by these five hindrances, particularly restlessness and lethargy. So we can practice and train our, our mind to abandon or suspend these five hindrances. And it's important to unify the chitta and the mano to bring them into a harmonious mental equilibrium. And uh, Brother Billy also took us through the evolving brain comprising of the cerebral cortex learning brain, the limbic system, which is the emotional brain, and the brain stem, which is the survival brain. We got to see the interplay between the body and the mind and how they affect each other. So what I learned, which was really interesting, is that the brain is not the mind. The activities of the brain leads to the experience of the mind. So in particular, the limbic system attaches emotional connotations to the conscious experience. So it's very natural also for us to be aware of pleasant or unpleasant experiences. And that's why we talk about um, being practicing uh, not having attachments and uh, not having expectations when it comes to Buddhist meditations. So now there's cognitive dissonance also when the mind is being torn between feeling and reasoning and leads to perplexity, indecisiveness, stress, distress, confusion, resulting in doubt or mind in turmoil. Um, and that, that's why we talk about the unification of the chitta and the mano. The, and the next point we learned is that there is no seat of the self. There is no part of the brain that has an identity that we call the self. So Brother Billy has also shown us the scientist's perspective that the brain is a highly distributed dynamic system that has no convergence center. Brother Billy also highlighted to us the levels of subconsciousness, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Now, hypnosis, transcendental meditation, chanting, and mantra-based meditation can lead to the slower, drowsy, more hypnotic states, which are the theta and delta brainwaves, sometimes the alpha. Long-term practice in vipassana, samat vipassana and samatha meditations can lead to the gamma frequencies, which are conducive for introspection and enhanced perception, perceptual clarity. And these uh, frequencies can take us to the, to the jhana states. Now, Brother Billy also showed us the signs of self-hypnosis state, which is like drowsiness, sleepiness, emotional arousal, physiological reactions in the body. And when the mind begins to engage with the mental object, or we start to imagine things. So if we fall into self-hypnosis states during meditation, we can recover by resetting our practice. You can alternate between sitting and walking meditations and avoid doing sitting meditations when we are physically tired or exhausted or shortly after meals. So um, that's about the wrap up that I have done. Uh, Brother Billy, is there anything you'd like to add? <laughs> oh, that's excellent. You are a great learner. Wow. <laughs> I'm so impressed. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. It was you, the teacher was very clear, you know, uh, in your point. So I got to wrap it up and summarize. So now, without further ado, let us put our hands together as Brother Billy leads us through the sharing of merits. Yes, okay. Uh, during this past hour and a half, we have spent a lot of time together sharing the Dharma. And this sharing has been very beneficial and meritorious. We have accumulated much merits from these meritorious activities. We realize also around the world, there are many people suffering, still suffering and continue to be suffering for some time in this coronavirus pandemic. We are the fortunate people who are able to sit here today and share the Dharma. So let us now share the merits we have accumulated with all these people who are suffering uh, from coronavirus pandemic, put our palms together and recite this together. We dedicate the merits we have acquired from sharing the Buddha Dharma to all beings affected by the coronavirus pandemic around the world. 
May suffering beings be suffering free. May the fear struck fearless be. May grieving beings shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. By the grace of the merits we have acquired, may we never follow the foolish. May we follow only the wise until we attain the highest and most supreme bliss of Nibbana. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Idang me nya tinang ho tu, sukita hon tu nya tayo. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you very much. That is the conclusion of my presentation today. Thank you for joining us. I wish you and your family, please stay safe. May you be well, comfortable, peaceful, and happy. Finally, over to you, sister, for the final word. Can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Your microphone oh, is off. I've been oh. muted again. <laughs> okay. Sadu, sadu, sadu. See, even the microphone does not wish to end the session. Huh. <laughs> Still wants more to learn. Okay, sadu, sadu, sadu. Uh, Thank you so much, Brother Billy. Okay. Uh, for being here and for enlightening us with this really, really um, informative session. I have gained so much knowledge. Uh, and it will help me with my meditation practice. And your hypnotherapy. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's so now I can see clearly, you know, the differences, the distinct the distinctions. So thank you so much. Very appreciative okay. of this. Hmm. Okay. So now I will uh, move on to, to announce to the viewers our upcoming activities. For upcoming virtual Dharma talks. We have uh, Sister Carol Kwok, who will be giving us a series of uh, talks on the 1st August, Illusions of, and Bubbles, 19th September, Five Hardcore Delusion and Wrong Views. And on the 17th of October, Emptiness is Form, Form is Emptiness. Um, tune in and, and, and check out uh, the Shah Alam Buddhist Society's Facebook page for more information. Now, Brother Billy has a YouTube channel and also Facebook page. So um, you can contact him via email or follow his Facebook page for more info and upcoming events. Brother Billy himself delivers some weekly talks every Monday. So you can uh, click on the links in the chat box for more information. Now, thank you for watching and tuning in, everyone. Have a very, very blessed Sunday. Enjoy your day, the rest of your day. And we apologize if you're not able to address all your questions. Uh, Brother Billy himself will uh, personally reply to the messages on Facebook. I understand there's one or two questions. So he will, he will attend to you. Rest assured. May you all be well, healthy, and peaceful. Have a lovely day. <laughs>